sometimes when I'm <coughs> driving with my husband, Frank, down to South Maryland to see my daughter, I start to think, and I'm thinking about uh, the next committee meeting, or what I'm going to preach on the next week, or what project, how, how we should be in mission the next month, or I'm worried about the people that have just had those tornadoes just two days ago. And I'm thinking, thinking, thinking. Women are built like a computer with one program running in the foreground and another program running on the background. And our minds are just running, 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 running. And then I'll turn to Frank and I'll say, what are you thinking about? And he'll answer, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. And I wonder how on earth it is that men can just drive and think of nothing else. But even though I can't get inside my husband's mind to know what he's thinking or what he's feeling, I know for sure that he loves me. I know this by the things that he does. For example, every night before we go to bed, he sets the coffee maker so that as soon as I get up in the morning, there's coffee. Because I'm not much good without that first cup. <laughs> he always makes sure that there is fuel in my car. And he always waits up for me, even when I'm at a downtown meeting and the meeting runs late. What a person is thinking, or who they are exactly on the inside, is a mystery. Yet we develop a general com of who they are through our experience of them. Today is Trinity Sunday, a day set aside to celebrate our triune God. The teachings of the Trinity come from our traditions. In the fourth <coughs> century, Constantine set the church fathers to define the core Christian beliefs. Their goal was to develop uniformity and unity within the faith, and their efforts brought forth the Nicene Creed, our basic statement of faith. So if our God, if our concept of God determines how we live, how we're un, if we understand then God as a solo, all-powerful authority, unmovable, domineering, then we start to emulate that model of power and control in our own lives. And we can end up with sports heroes that are out to be the star scorer rather than team players trying to work together. Or we could end up with business people trying to make profits for their personal gain and not responsible managers caring for their employees and their customers and maybe even the environment. Or parents that drag their children from scouts to dance to uh, sports practice, not because the child has an interest in that, that would be great, but because they're trying to groom perfect future leaders. But we don't have to know the Trinity as a domineering remote ruler. The ancients wanted us to know God as the divine community that operates on love. And so they named the Trinity the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. More recent naming has included their functions, creator, redeemer, sustainer. And even more recent language has given us presence, wisdom, and power. These are just some of the ways that humans trying to get their mind around the mystery to explain how humanity encounters God. And it's difficult because the relationship is unique and it's based on a deep, sacrificial love. When Jesus went out in the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, he prayed to Abba God, his Father. Now, not wait till your father gets home kind of father. More like Daddy or Dad close relationship, the loving parent who listens to prayers with an open heart. Abba God loved us so much that when humanity fell into repetitive patterns of sins, he sent us Jesus 
to break that pattern. And when we still didn't get it, Jesus gave up his life on the cross for us, freely dying so that our sins would be redeemed and restored and we'd be back in relationship with the Father God. The Holy Spirit worked in and through that moment, too. Jesus on the cross gave up his spirit to the Father, and the Father, through resurrection, gave the spirit back to Jesus, and together they sent the advocate, the counselor, the spirit of truth to the people at Pentecost. The Trinity sacrifices all for love. As humans, we want to know what each part of that trinity does. We want to be able to say, okay, the Almighty Father, that's the creator. Or Jesus shows us the ethical ways of life. You know, what would Jesus do? And the Holy Spirit, that's the one that shows us the mystical powers of prayer and meditation and being fully present with ourselves and with others. But the trinity can't simply be defined this way. All three persons of the Trinity work in community because they are one. For example, all three are present at creation. Well, the very first paragraph in the Bible tells of God breathing his spirit over the formless void to begin creation. And the first sentence in the book of John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in John 14 we read, I am the Father, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. And the words that I speak to you I do not say by myself, but it is the Father who does his work through me. And then Jesus continues to teach that the Spirit of truth will take what is Christ's, and what is God the Father's, and declare it to the disciples. The Spirit of truth will be the communicator of the Trinity. The Trinity worked together in creation. On the cross, the Trinity worked through death and resurrection, sacrificing all for love. And the Trinity will continue to work in the, until the kingdom of heaven has come. There's an inexplicable entwining, indwelling, intercommunication between the three persons of the Trinity. I say inexplicable, and yet I stand here right now trying to explain it to you so that you have an inkling of the magnitude of love that's involved. The Trinity shares this relationship of love. Think about when we fall in love. That relationship, that new relationship becomes alive with emotion and empathy. Lover and loved one are like one. Individuals shine. They actually discover themselves through the love of the other. And the caring is so deep and full that it spills over into the rest of your family life. And people can't help but be with you and feel that love of that relationship. Well, theologians call this swirling mash of love, this give and take that can spill over into even our lives. They call it perichoresis. I put that word on the front of your bulletin just because she wanted to learn a new word today. They compare it to a divine dance, a round dance, where the partners are equal and they take turns leading and they're constantly celebrating their togetherness. When we worship the Trinity, we celebrate that love the love that flows in that eternal dance. Think of some of your very best moments in life. Maybe your wedding day, or the birth and baptism of your child, or maybe it's hugging a spouse who's recovering for an illness, or sitting quietly having a relationship conversation with someone that you're close to, or having your teacher or mentor confirm that what you're doing is right, or simply the sound of children playing. All of these are relationship moments. We're at our best when we're in relationship. The ultimate relationship is the one shared within the Trinity. Trinity means community. Trinity means love. 
Humans want to categorize and explain and apply scientific knowledge to the concept of God. Maybe we hope that by understanding that, we can control that. But the three persons being one in God doesn't fit with our modern day thinking. The eternal nature of that, of God, is just that, a mystery over which we have no control. God can't be made in our image. We can't apply our rugged American individualism on God's character. It's the other way around. When we are at our best, when we remember that we are made in God's image. Nowhere in the scriptures is the doctrine of Trinity printed as a proposed belief or a statement of fact. And yet, everywhere in our scriptures, the Trinity is perceived as present and active, as the effectual creative power in all of our lives. The Trinity permeates our church life. We baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when we have the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we gather as a community and we act out the very life and communion of the Trinity. And when we as a congregation show our community how to conserve water, or when we provide clean drinking water to the hospital in Mutari in Zimbabwe, or the people of the Appalachian region. Or when we go and visit someone who's sick and bring cheer to them. Or when we teach others about the good news. Or when that's when we are trying to embody the Trinity's justice, equality, and generation, generosity. That's when we're being more like the Trinity in our life together. Trinity is the name of the mystery that constitutes and transforms and heals the word. And if we envision the Trinity as cooperative, loving community, working together on all of life's aspects, then we strive for that, that kind of love in our families, that kind of love in our congregations, that kind of love in our workplaces. That loving dance of the Holy Trinity has everything to do with everything we do. Amen. <laughs>